Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. You. Today we're going to be dealing with a parable that's found in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. We've talked about parables before, but I want to remind you now about some principles of interpreting parables that need to be remembered because you can make the Bible say almost anything uh, by interpreting these parables in the minutest detail. First of all, it's very important to watch the context that comes into a parable and the context that comes out. In our parable today, it is crucial we see the context that comes in and goes out. It's also important to try to summarize the major truth of the parable in one simple declarative sentence and not push all the details because when we do, we get some radical statements uh, that are not true. Let's see. Okay. Let's notice the context that comes in. Jesus has been talking about the problems connected with wealth, that it's harder for a camel to go through the eye of a needle it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then uh, Peter asked this question, What about us, Lord? We've left everything to follow you. And Jesus then discusses briefly about rewards, that those who follow him in this world, in this life, will have rewards in the life to come. Now, then comes this parable. Now, as soon as this parable is over, in verse uh, 17 again, we're going to notice that they're going to start... Uh, asking for the, the, the best seats in the kingdom. And matter of fact, down in 2020, uh, they're going to want to have this first and second places, James and John. So here we have an example of the disciples' misunderstanding of, of uh, rewards and their authority and, uh, and those kinds of things. And I think when you see it in that context, that this parable has some great meaning. When you take it out of this context, uh, you can put say some pretty heretical things about what's going to be said. Now, um, notice then, for the kingdom of heaven, again, God's ways are so different than man's ways. The kingdom of heaven is the reign of God in men's hearts now that will one day be consummated over all the earth. God's people have to be different now. The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, is characteristics of the kingdom man that is meant to be lived out here, although it's in foreign soil here. So the, the, the kingdom of, of heaven, I think the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are synonymous, is like the owner of an estate who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. He doesn't say it here, but the implication of what happens and the rush and concern about it, it seems to mean that it was uh, the harvest time for the grapes and that possibly uh, a Sabbath was coming up. And they needed to get as many grapes in as possible before the, the, the Sabbath, when the, the grapes were already ripe and they didn't want them to rot or get too ripe. That seems to be the implication of why this vineyard owner acted this way in the parable, although it's not stated. Now, some have said this is kind of symbolic of uh, uh, the vineyard owner is the Messiah and the vineyard is the, the people of God. And there, there is some thrust in that, but I think taking it literally here is better than trying to read the, those allegorical meanings into it. And when he had contracted with the laborers at 20 cents a day, well, the, all this monetary equivalent uh, in translation is not helpful. Uh, this is a denarius, and basically it was a day's wage for an agricultural laborer or a soldier. So it was enough money to provide the daily needs of a family. Now, I don't know what that would be in our day, a whole lot more than 20 cents. It was that general normal wage for a, 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 a blue-collar worker uh, for one day. Now, he made kind of a deal with them. made a contract with them. He told them exactly what he would pay them for a day's wage. It was the normal wage. They were, they were tickled to death to get work. And so they were standing around the square, apparently, early in the morning, hoping someone would come hire them. And he did, and uh, they went with him. And he sent them off to his vineyard. Then he went out again about 9 o'clock. Now, literally in the translations here, we have so many hours. The Jews basically are going to start about 6 o'clock in the morning and start counting the time from there. Uh, they divide the, the day and the night into twilight is the beginning, and so you, and it's in 12-hour uh, shifts after that. So you can see what's kind of happening there. He went out about uh, 9 o'clock and found others standing around doing nothing. Now, they probably went back to the marketplace where these men would gather. Uh, it'd be in our day like going to a, 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 an employment agency that does day laborers. He went there early and got everybody they had. 
But others came in a little late. They were also looking for work. So he went back after a while, about 9 o'clock, and hired some more men. But he didn't make a contract with them about giving them a denarius. Apparently he just says, I'll give you what's fair. They say, fine. So they go to work for him. He did the same thing about 11 o'clock. Uh, and then notice verse 6, about 5 o'clock. Only one hour left in, the, in the, uh, the daylight time. Now, they may have worked a little, a little as long as day lasts. And how long the day lasts, I'm not knowing. Maybe it was an hour left, two hours, maybe three hours. I don't know how long exactly. But it was part of the end of the day. And he found some more people. And he went out again and found still others standing around. And he said to them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? And they, and they answered him, because nobody has hired us. And he said to them, uh, you too go out into my vineyard. Now, I don't think that you can uh, read into this. They were lazy and didn't want to work. Maybe they had gone to, to one place looking for work. Maybe they'd gone to another place. And finally, they ended up in a central marketplace, standing around hoping somebody yet would come by and hire them so they'd have food for their family that night. The owner came there. It was late, late, late in the day. But apparently the, the owner had compassion on these people. He wanted to give them a chance to work if they wanted to. And also, I think probably the crop uh, needed to be harvested right then. So you can either say it was compassion on the part of the vineyard owner or it was expediency, in which it is uh, the parable itself does not comment on that. When evening came, now of course we're not sure exactly what evening is. We would think it means 6 o'clock, the normal end of the Jewish day. But knowing that these agricultural laborers uh, labored all as far as daylight from the early morning till, till the, the sun went down, it may just mean the evening hours and not exactly at 6 o'clock. The owner of the vineyard said to his master, uh, call the laborers and pay them their wages. Now, this goes back to the Deuteronomic law. A daily wage owner was to be given his wage at the end of the day so he could buy food for his family. Now, the landowners wanted to hold that wage till tomorrow to make sure he would come back. Uh, but that, that's against the law of Moses. Leviticus 19.13 and Deuteronomy 24.15. Beginning with the last and ending with the first. And they who had been hired at five o'clock, just a couple, an hour or maybe a couple more, came and received a denarius. And those who were hired first, when they came, supposed that they would receive more. Why? Because they've been working more. They worked through the heat of the day. They carried the burden of the, uh, of the harvesting. And they thought, boy, if he's paying these guys just been here a couple of hours a denarii, he's going to give us a lot more than he contracted us for. Watch what happens. Um... And those who were hired first, when they came, supposed they had received more, but they too received a denarius each. And when they received it, they began to grumble. This is imperfect tense. They began to grumble over and over against the owner of the estate, saying, Of these last worked only one hour, and yet uh, you put them on the same footing with us who have borne the heavy burdens of the scorching heat of the day. Uh, now, I want to say a word to you here, because I think it's going to be interpreted in just a minute. It seems to me that, that this is a parable related to Peter. Peter said, Oh, Lord, we've left everything. What are we going to get? It's the spirit of what's in it for us. We've sacrificed Jesus. We've followed you. Uh, we're, not, we're not wealthy in this world like these other people. What are we going to get out of this? And Jesus tells him, You're going to be rewarded. But Peter kind of had this, uh, this spirit of what's in it for me. And I think this parable is directed toward that. We see that most of the disciples had this kind of jealous, competitive, what am I going to get out of its spirit? Because in the very context that follows this parable, we have them arguing over who is greatest, uh, trying to get the best seats of the kingdom, and on and on. It's amazing. And so maybe we ought to say to religious workers, whether you're an evangelist or a Sunday school teacher, whether you've been saved since childhood and worked for the Lord every year or just been saved, the reward comes by the grace of God, not by human merit. This is what the landowner is going to say. But he answered one of them, apparently the one who was griping the most, the ringleader of the grumbling. Friend, I am, am I doing you injustice? Did you not contract with me for one denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I want to give this man hired last as much as I do you. Have I the right to do what I please with my own money? Or is your eye causing you to be covetous because I am generous? Now, the word uh, your eye causing you to be covetous is the famous uh, little idiom, the evil eye. It's kind of a metaphor for a bad attitude. We see it in First Samuel, excuse me, Deuteronomy 15.9 and then First Samuel 18.9. It's a clear evidence of this evil eye. Those 
who are now last will be first then, and those who will be first will be last. Now, this is the very same phrase that ends chapter 19, 1930. This is what Jesus says to Peter after his discussion of rewards. Now, tell me, please, what this means for us. Now, I think there are two dangers here. One danger is reading too much into this and saying, no matter what you do for the Lord, we're all going to receive the same reward. They all received one denarii. We're all going to receive one denarii. You really can't do that with parables because if you do that, that implies that those who have not served the Lord, those who have waited to the last minute to be saved, those who have just kind of wasted their life and their resources and then get serious about God, uh, are on the same par with those who've lived a sacrificial, loving life. It is obvious there are rewards. That's what he was telling Peter. It's not that we're all going to receive the same reward. That's not what this is saying. There's obviously different kind of rewards. What this is saying is this. Now listen, to, think through this. Everything that we have from God comes from His grace and not from our merit or our deserve. We don't really receive rewards because of all that we do because the truth is all that we have comes from God. We do receive rewards because of our availability, our usefulness to the kingdom, our service for Him. Now, it's not that we deserve it, but the Bible talks about rewards. And I think we have to say the gospel is free, but then we have the choice of are we going to walk in it? Are we going to take advantage of the opportunities of service? Are we going to be what God wants us to be? That is what I think this thrust is all about. And there's another little phrase in here that you might notice that I did not read. Uh, it's a little phrase that is found in chapter 2214, but is not found really in this place in the best manuscripts, and it doesn't really make sense here. It's, in, it's, it's omitted in Aleph, which is a Sinaiticus, and B, which is Vaticanus, and also manuscript L. So uh, I think it probably shouldn't be here because it doesn't fit at all. Well, well tell me again, what do you think this, this is talking about? Well, number one, I think it means we're, that, that rewards will not be equal, but they will be mer given out on the basis of grace, not on merit. And number two, I think it's also important, there is a spiritual reversal of earthly standards in the kingdom of God. Remember, we're talking about the, the kingdom of heaven is likened to. God's way of looking at the world is so different than man's way. We are competitive. We are aggressive. The one who works the hardest is the one who ought to get the most. But that is not true of the kingdom of God. God's uh, uh, dispensation, God's administration is based on who he is, not on ho who we are. Aren't you glad you don't get what you deserve from God? Oh, friends, I don't want the justice of God. I want the mercy of God. Now, so there's a reversal. It's kind of like Lazarus and the rich man. Uh, in, during his life, Lazarus uh, was so poor. He loved God, but he was sick and hungry. The rich man had everything, seemingly. This is the same context. Jesus, are all these rich men, are they rich because God loves them more? No, Jesus says quite the opposite. It's very hard for them to enter into the spiritual kingdom. Well, Jesus, what, what about this? Uh, if, if, if that's not true, are we ever going to have anything? Jesus says, yes, we're going to have things. You see, Lazarus and the rich man's their roles were reversed in heaven. It's also the idea, I think, of, of the thief on the cross. Uh, here's a man who accepts the Lord the last moments of his life, but he is going to receive the full kingdom like those who have served Jesus all of their days. Um, I think when we see this, it begins to help the gospel ring with clarity. Uh, but it, it's, it's not uh, uh, the clarity that means we don't need to strive to serve the Lord. It's the wonderful truth that God deals with us by grace and not by merit. Mm. Now, the next one, um, a warning against a hireling mentality. Now, I want to say to you that in uh, chapter uh, 1927, notice, notice, what, notice what it says here. And Peter answered, We've left everything and followed you. What are we to get? Is it true you think that some people serve God only because of what they'll get out of it? Remember, that's what the devil accused Job of doing. Ah, uh, he only serves you because of what he gets out of the relationship. If everything was taken away, would we still serve God? 
Now, there's a good question for us. Peter is saying, what do I get out of this deal, Lord? What if Peter got nothing but serving God? Would that be enough? You see, I'm afraid we get down to this Pharisee attitude, this hireling attitude. Now, God, I don't spit. I don't dance. I don't chew. I don't go with those who do. I don't play cards. I don't go to bad movies. I don't cuss. Uh, I go to church every Sunday. I even go to Sunday school. I even go to Wednesday night. I'm something special. Hey, God, you must really be glad to have me. Yuck. This is the problem in the parable of the, of the prodigal son and the elder brother. The elder brother thinks that he's so wonderful. He stayed home and worked, therefore he deserves all his father has. Oh, friend, this spirit, this elder brother spirit of legalism and judgmentalism and criticalism and comparing other Christians to make yourself look better and think you ought to get more is going to be a real shocker in heaven because those who you think are, are first, like Nicodemus, didn't, didn't, what, didn't he look like he was first? And Jesus told him he had to begin all over again. Here's the next parable in John is the, is the uh, woman at the well. Oh, my goodness. It was anybody lower morally and socially than her. And yet the same salvation that came to Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews, is the very same free salvation that came to the Samaritan woman. So immoral. You see, it's the thrust that God will accept all who come unto him. But I think what we have to say is this parable is not uh, the whole truth, right? No, there's another truth, and that is there is a striving. There is a service. There is a commitment. There is a follow-through. There is a walk worthy that's another side to this truth. This is the idea that it's really free. It's in Christ. It's in the, the, the grace of God, and it's whosoever will. Now, it's been interesting. Now, through the years, the early church fathers interpreted this parable as referring to the Gentiles and the Jews. And although there is an application there, in context, it can't refer to that at all. I realize if you take the whole New Testament into context, then maybe there, that truth is here. Uh, but in immediate context, it's not dealing with Jew and Gentile. Guess who it's dealing with? It's dealing with the disciples. Now, do you think that there was some jealousy among these disciples? Do you think this inner circle of Peter, James, and John may have said to the other ones, well, we were with the Lord when he did so and so? Do you think there was any jealousy about, well, we were the first to follow the Lord. We were his first apostles. We were the first ones. Do you think there was any jealousy among them? Oh, friend, don't you know there was? It comes out in the fact they're arguing over who's going to be greatest. That, Peter and, uh, that James and John want to be uh, on his right hand and on his left when he comes into his kingdom. Does that ever happen among modern Christians? Well, I've gone to so-and-so seminary. Oh, well, I've served the Lord so many years. Well, I've been a missionary. Uh, well, I, I, I've, on and on, friends, I think whenever you try to put God's kingdom and God's love and even God's rewards on the basis of human merit, you get into a real ditch. And that's what this parable is trying to protect us from. Notice back over here in chapter 18, verse 1. Listen to this, 18:1. Just at that moment, the disciples came up and asked Jesus, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They're wondering about who's greatest. Over here in 19, the first now will be last then. And many who are last now will be first then. You might well see Mark 10, 31. And then right at the end of this parable, the end of this parable is um, give orders that my, the two sons of mine may sit on your right and on your left when you come into your kingdom. My, we need to hear this parable. Yes, it's important how we live. Yes, our life needs to reflect who Jesus Christ is. Yes, we are witnesses. Yes, Christ's likeness is the goal of the, of the Christian life. It's the goal of God for every believer. But folks, salvation is free. Absolutely free. This relationship continues, I think, to cause uh, not only uh, problems but misunderstandings in the kingdom of God. Uh, I hope it's something that, that you're going to uh, think through. Remember, these parables must be related to their immediate context coming in and their immediate context going out. 
Uh, one of my favorite books on the Gospels is a, is a book called The Christ of the Gospels by Shepherd. I believe it's out of print. I'm so sorry. It's one of the most helpful books on the Gospels. But I wanted to read you uh, uh, something that I found in here when I was reading through it for this lesson. Uh, and it's, um, it comes out of the life of Thomas Aquinas, the chief uh, theologian for the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, listen to this little discussion. Um, according to the legend, was addressed by Jesus uh, to Thomas Aquinas one day in his devotions. Thomas, thou hast written much and wail concerning me. What shall I give thee for thy work? And Thomas answered, Nothing but thyself, O Lord. And then the comment comes, They that work for reward do not get as much as they want, and they that work for love get more than they expect. I think that's so true. Why are you serving the Lord? Are you afraid of Him? Are you afraid if you, if you break a rule that you'll be punished, He'll give you cancer, take away your family, hurt your business? Are you serving Him because you want to be successful and healthy and live longer and have people know you? Why are you serving the Lord? There are rewards. I don't understand them completely. I often kid about the fact that I think when we get to heaven, it's like, like an RA uh, meeting. You know, royal ambassadors, when they go, the young kids go to these track meets and stuff. Every young person gets a ribbon on those events. Every, now, some get first place, but every person gets a ribbon. I think the rewards in heaven are going to be like that. I usually make this analogy. We're all going to, we have different sized cups. Everybody's cup's going to be full, but we have different sized cups. But you know what? I'm not going to know what size cup yours is and what size cup mine is because I'm afraid I'd be jealous throughout eternity. No, all are going to be rewarded. There is a difference in rewards. I think there's a difference in rewards a difference in, in degrees of punishment. There are degrees. But the basis of acceptance is not what we do, but who God is and what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. We must lock that down. We must hear that again. I'm afraid the, uh, we were all jealous about someone who is saved on their deathbed. And uh, boy, surely they won't get as much as we have who've served the Lord all of our life that's exactly what this parable is talking about. Oh, that denomination surely won't get as much as we do because they just don't keep as many rules as I do. That's exactly, exactly what this parable is talking about. Jealousy and comparisons and expectations among the followers of the Lord. Not Jews and Gentiles, necessarily. But jealousy. Um, kind of a hireling spirit a competitiveness among the children of God. It should not be so for those who are first in the kingdom now will be last. Those who are last now will be first then. I've often said that we sometimes think people like uh, Billy Graham or some uh, national teacher or evangelist, that they're going to be right up there. Boy, the Lord's going to be so, so glad to see them. I can remember when I went to India on a mission trip and we went to a house of a little Indian lady who sold tracks in, in southern India. And before we left, the pastor I was with asked this lady to pray for us. Here we were, great missionaries from North America there to, to, uh, to preach in India. This little Indian lady who did not have my education, did not have my economic benefits, uh, did not have all the resources I had, that little lady I can remember in my mind still fell on her knees and began to pray. Oh, I felt like I was in the presence of God. Who that little Indian lady was had nothing to do with the things that I so often think are so important. Does that happen in your life? Do you get mad when others get recognized and praised? You think it ought to be you because you worked the hardest, you did the best, you did the most, you did the longest. Think through this again. Watch out for that elder brother mentality. Watch out for that Pharisaic, rule-oriented competitiveness, judgmentalism. It's all free. It's all of God. And now that we have it, run the race. Walk worthy of the calling wherewith you've been called. Walk in the light as He is in the light. Walk in love just as God and Christ love you. We need to hear that. It's free, but it costs everything. We've won the race in Jesus Christ. 
But now we've got to run the race out of gratitude for Jesus Christ. Well, I have really enjoyed being with you, and I'll see you again same time, same place next week. God bless you.